Geek Therapy Radio. Howdy, partners. Welcome to the Geek Therapy Radio podcast based out of Houston, Texas. What if my accent was really like that? If you had just heard me, this is not going to be a show about accents, but if you had just heard me, I've done a show about accents. If you had just heard me on the street speaking in my normal speaking voice, which is what you hear more or less on Geek Therapy Radio, I do a little bit more of a broadcastery kind of from the bottom of my diaphragm voice when I do a podcast or a radio show, but if you just heard me on the street, my accent, where would you think I was from? And I actually, now that I think about it, I'm asking kind of a rhetorical question, but if you want to let me know, you know how to get in touch with me, geektherapyradio.com. Just go right there, fill out that little contact form and let me know where you think that I'm from based on my accent. Or of course you can email me geektherapy at iheartmedia.com. Let me know on let me know on Twitter, Geek Therapy Radio on Twitter. I think actually the technical handle on Twitter is at Geek Therapy KPRC. But if you t- if you just search for Geek Therapy Radio, look for the red, white, and black color scheme. That's me. But let me know if you just heard me speaking, just like this. Hey man, how's it going? My name's Johnny. What uh how you doing? Where would you think I was from? And would it at all cross your mind that I was from Texas? We had this kind of stereotypical idea of a southern accent, specifically a, a Texan accent. I think even people from Europe, and correct me if I'm wrong, my European friends and listeners, when you think of an accent from the United States, I think there are three, I would assume, and weigh in European listeners, GeekTherapyRadio.com. I think there are three accents that most Europeans would be able to to pinpoint or think are stereotypically American accents. One, New York. Hey, how you doing? I'm from New York. Uh, all these accents are accents that you hear on TV. And since American TV is worldwide and most people, what they know about America is from... TV, then they're going to hear these very characterized, uh, uh, very extreme accents. So you'll hear the New York accent, one. I think the second accent that is most stereotypical that that a European might, uh, that might come to the mind of a European is Texan. Howdy, y'all. I'm from Texas. Rope them, ride them. Yeehaw. That's a very stereotypical Texan accent. And then you might think the third accent, if those, if there is a third, I think New York accent, number one, Texan accent, number two, and the third most stereotyped would be West Coast, like Valley Girl or Surfer Dude, you know, totally dude, want to go surfing, brah? I was just chilling at the farmer's market, caught some, (laughs) caught me some gnar cabbage. That was a terrible West Coast (laughs) accent. (laughs) Terrible. But I think those are the top three. Maybe fourth would be Midwest. Don't you know? I'm from Wisconsin, don't you know? You hear that accent in the movie Fargo. It's a very popular movie, Fargo. So those top three with a possible fourth. New York accent, Texan accent, West Coast accent, and possibly a Midwest accent. Then there'd be a, it would go a little bit further, Boston accent, park the car. <laughs> park the car. Then there's a whole bunch of Southern accents. And that's the same thing. I mean, all I'm getting at is this. This is just where my mind goes at the beginning of, of the podcast here. I am going to talk about some tech, techy kind of neat things here coming up. Uh, I got a new tablet. I want to talk about 
uh, a DJI drone, a, a cool update that's ha- that's happened or happening, about to happen. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, but also AMD Ryzen Zen 3 5000 series chip, something in particular about that. But we're talking about accents here right off the bat. They're stereotypical accents, but anybody listening to this from any part of the world, whether you are from the UK and you speak the Queen, the Queen's English, whether you're from Europe and you speak Dutch or French or German or whatever your your native language is, or you're from Japan or the Middle East, you know that there's the stereotypical accent. And don't get me started on what a stereotypical Middle Eastern accent would be that most people would think. But you know, if you're from those regions, that the accents vary wildly. For instance, the, the uh, a Welsh accent, Cogni accent, Irish, Scottish, those are all from the same sort of region of the world, mostly, but they are all very distinctive and different. Same thing with American accents. Same thing, you get into microcosms of, of American accents. Around the South, a, a Florida accent would be different than an Alabama accent, would be different than a Georgia accent. And then you say, let's just pick Georgia. There'd be different accents depending on where you are in Georgia. It's very nuanced. And I would imagine also, if you speak Dutch, there are probably a half a dozen, if not more so, accents in Dutch, depending on whether you're from Holland that that region of Holland, I, I don't know all the regions of of the Netherlands, but it's it's Holland. There's different. When you think of Holland, technically speaking, Holland isn't all of the Netherlands, if I'm correct on that. And I know I have some from some listeners from the Netherlands who can shed some light on that. But if you look at the map of Holland, it's not all of the Netherlands. It's there's different regions to the Netherlands. I'm sure, there's all sorts of Dutch accents. I'm sure there's all sorts of German accents, French accents. No matter what the region, no matter what the stereotypical accent is, you know if you're from that region that there are dozens of accents. And accents can change from village to village even. From town to town even, accents can change. It's all very fascinating uh, to think about. Didn't know I was going to go off on a seven-minute tangent about this, but we're all geeks about something. And this is a geek thing that kind of popped into my brain right off the bat here. Okay, so... I received my new tablet. Those of you, you, some of you have reached out and suggested tablets to me. So I finally got the new tablet. The, the deal was that, and what spurred all of this is my wife's iPad. I forget what kind of iPad she has, but her iPad is a few, uh, 2012, 2013. It's, it's getting long in the tooth and it's not getting updates anymore the important updates that she needs for so some of her applications or apps applications what am i 90 some of her apps aren't working properly because she can't update to ios 14 or whatever it is so i got my ipad a year or two ago i think it's a 2018 just a basic baseline ipad and i loved it it's great it's the only apple product that i use every single day is my iPad, 9.7 inch iPad. So the deal was, okay, well, I'll give you my iPad. It still has a few years left of, of life and it's still a great tablet. The battery still lasts a long time. It's, it's wonderful, it's snappy. It still gets every update that comes down. I said, I'll give you my iPad and I will get an Android. I will get a new Android tablet for the first time since I got my NVIDIA Shield tablet way back in 2014, which is ancient when it comes to Android tablets especially. It's ancient when it comes to iPads also, but ancient especially when it comes to Android tablets. And and the reason I wanted to go Android it's because I'm hugely into emulations and emulation and sideloading apps and you have a lot more you have a lot more freedom on Android than you do in Apple. Apple's apps are masterfully optimized for the iPad. Every app you use that I used, I can only speak for myself, every app that I used on my iPad worked almost perfectly. I mean, there is an occasional crash here and there. I think that comes down to a, a memory issue, RAM. 
uh, some like Auto Trader. I'd be on Auto Trader looking for Chevy Bolts, and it would just crash or say that it couldn't populate the search or whatever. And it sometimes would just go right to the desktop, right to the home screen. I don't know where, just be searching for something. And I think that was a kind of a RAM issue. But any by, by and large, using the iPad as a con, as a consumption device, Netflix and surfing the web and listening to music. I would listen to podcasts every night when I go to bed through my iPad and a little Bluetooth earpiece. I love the iPad. I'm not giving up the iPad. I'm just giving it to my wife. If I need to use the iPad for something, it's still available. So I said, you know what? It's about time I jump back into a flagship Android tablet. So going to an Android tablet means that while, no, the apps aren't as robust and polished as they are for iPad, for instance, uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, drawing apps and, 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 and apps for creators and, and comic book writers and, and drawers and and painters and, and, and whatnot. There's a lot, there's apps for the iPad that are great, that work with the Apple Pencil perfectly. It feels like it's well thought out, all follow through. You feel like you have all the support in the world behind those apps. Whereas on the Android side, it's not so robust for those types of, of artistic apps. The, the, the Samsung, the S Pen is great. I don't use the S Pen all the time. The S Pen is really cool, and there are very cool apps, very cool artistic apps that facilitate that, but it just they doesn't feel as premium and as well thought out as the apps on, on the iPad. But the trade-off, though, is that while a lot of apps don't feel as, as polished and well thought out as, as, a, as it would coming on, the, uh, on iOS, going to Android, they're still perfectly serviceable, and there are absolutely just stellar applications for the Android. But what you give up in any perceived kind of polish or, or support for well-thought-out, well-supported apps is that you get a lot more freedom with what you can and can't install on an Android. You can use APKs. You can basically install whatever software you want. You don't have to go through all this uh app signature stuff and you don't have to get it verified by apple and everything you can if someone made an apk if someone made an app for android it doesn't have to be verified it's at your own risk you can install it you know like i said at your own risk there's a lot more freedom and i always thought here's the big thing if i'm really honest with you and i'm really honest with myself gaming in android to me is so much better on, for my needs and my use case. And I'm not saying gaming on the iPad is is bad. You you can do cloud gaming on the iPad. You can do you can link with your Steam account and be playing a game on your iPad with a Bluetooth controller that's running. You know the game itself is running on your desktop PC up in your bedroom or something like that. So you can be down on your five gigahertz Wi-Fi and be playing. I don't know, Rocket League on your iPad. You can do that. It's not a whole lot of rigmarole, but it's it's some. What I'm getting at is emulation. I always thought that the iPad would be just perfect, just just 100% perfect if it was a lot easier to emulate, to, to run emulators without jailbreaking and doing all sorts of of hard tethers and soft tethers and no tether jailbreaks and every time if you jail let's say you jailbreak ipad os 14.01 uh, or whatever and then 14.1 comes out or 14.2 comes out and now a lot of apps aren't compatible with it they say you need to get ios 14.2 or whatever you need to upgrade from wherever you at and you're constantly this is constant kind of cat and mouse chase between jailbreaking your iPad and then uh, and then it's okay while the those applications work on that version of iOS and then if you really need to use an application let's say your email client stops working on this older version of iOS and the jailbroken version of iOS and now you need to upgrade to the new version of iOS but that will mean that your device isn't jailbroken anymore and there's always the question will they jailbreak this new version of ios and do you want to wait a few weeks or months days weeks or months for the jailbreak to happen on this new current version of ios it's just an it's just a headache it's such a headache to 
to get Cydia working and doing all sorts of jailbreaking to your iPad just to run Super Nintendo emulators or NES emulators or Game Gear emulators, Master System emulators, play, uh, PSP emulators. It's a, it's a nightmare compared to the Android side where you want to play PSP games? Here's a freaking ML PP SSPP right here in the Play Store. You want to play Super Nintendo games? Here's the freaking emulator right here in the Play Store. It's it's on Google's own, you know, service. Here, just download a Game Boy emulator. You don't need a jailbreak or hack anything. Just download it right from Google Play. You can do it. It's so much easier to run emulators on an Android device. And that's what was really important to my use case scenario. Yes, the iPad is great and I really enjoyed using it, and I have no qualms using an iPad, but I really missed having all of my emulators on a tablet. So, the tablet I bought, I actually bought on Prime Day. I bought a Samsung Galaxy Tab S6. Not the S7, not the S7 Plus, not an S older S4, not an S6 Lite. I bought a Samsung Galaxy Tab S6 with a Snapdragon 855, 8 gigs of RAM, and 256 gigabytes of storage, and a whole slew of other things that make this tablet awesome. I love this tablet. I've only had it for less than 24 hours, and I have just, I adore it. I've been running all my PSP games at full tilt. Let me tell you something. It'll get a little bit diverted here. Let's talk about how powerful it is at emulation. A lot of you listening to it to me right now probably know, or are, are probably also fans of a YouTube channel called ETA Prime. I love ETA Prime. And a lot of your ears just perked up. Oh man, I love ETA Prime too. ETA Prime, one reason why we love him is he does all sorts of very kind of he digs deep into the emulation testing emulation on various devices and products from cheap laptops like the uh, amazon kindle fire 10 which is a great laptop or great uh, tablet all the way up to flagship tablets like the ipad pros and uh, samsung galaxy tab s7 plus let's say so one of the things he showcases is how how great it is to run kind of harder emulators so playstation 2 which is still very iffy on tablets even right now as a recording uh playstation portable or so the psp uh dolphin emulators which the dolphin emulates the gamecube and the wii in the wii u and the galaxy tab s6 i have right here runs dolphin amazingly i tested out with smash brothers brawl 60 frames a second no problem pairs right up to my xbox one uh, s controller over bluetooth it is f almost flawless using the dolphin emulator on the galaxy tab s6 psp emulation through PPSS PP god of war doesn't even bat an eye nothing to, ha, just no sweat running god of war god of war for tablets and smartphones is always kind of the benchmark. Can you run, can you, if for, as far as emulation is going, one of the benchmarks for emulation, for solid emulation, is God of War. Either of them, Ghost of Sparta, Chains of Olympus, either of those for PSP. Can you emulate God of War on PPSSPP on your tablet or phone? And if it can, that means you've got a good device that's capable of, you know, almost anything. That's state of the art. So obviously, yes, Snapdragon 855. God of War runs flawlessly on the Galaxy Tab S6. Mario Kart Wii. I just said Super Smash Bros. Brawl on Dolphin. I haven't tested out PS2 emulation. ETA Prime has, and it's when he did it, it, it just it's really not there yet. You're not going to be playing Shadow of the Colossus and anything playable. I wish. One day, maybe. That all boils down to optimization of the PS2 emulation, and there's really not as far as I know, a whole lot of activity as far as optimizing, anybody actively working steadily on optimizing PlayStation 2 emulation. So anyways, this Galaxy Tab S6, it's a year old, and it's still just an emulation beast. Just 
a bulldozer. It's amazing at emulation. And here's the kicker. I am running this tablet in power saving mode, which means that Snapdragon 855 processor, which is still a spectacular uh, processor by 2020 standards even, that Snapdragon 855 is only running at peak 70% of its full capacity. 70%. I'm leaving 30%, a huge chunk, over a quarter, almost a third of the processing power on the table. That's how much headroom I have left, but I'm running it in this power saving mode. So the Dolphin emulator running Super Smash Bros. Ball, Brawl and GameCube games almost flawlessly, that's at only 70% capacity of what the processor is capable of. How's that for a kicker? The second kicker, and the biggest reason why I got the Tab S6 now, is that, hey, good timing. The gag gal Galaxy, the Galaxy Tab S7 just came out, so of course the Tab S6 is going to have price discounts, and it perfectly coincided with Prime Day. A lot of people poo-poo on Prime Day, and I, I would admit that I don't really care too much about Amazon Prime Day. Forgot about it, really. But on, during on Prime Day, the price had been reduced by like $150. From 700 to 550 for the Galaxy Tab S6, 8 gigabyte version with 256 gigabytes of RAM. So it was down to $550. Plus, maybe I just got lucky because it certainly isn't this way now, and it certainly wasn't this way even an hour after I or ordered it. It lets you do that uh, 0%. Five installment, five payments, you know, five month payment plan. So five hundred fifty dollars spread across five months. I'm paying what is it like one hundred ten, hundred twenty dollars ish a month for five months for this thing. It just made it all the more accessible. It was a perfect time to pick one up. That if you have an Amazon like credit card or something like that, yeah, you can do these kind of as payment plans. I think it's for a lot longer than five months. But every once in a while, to Prime members, sounds like an ad for Amazon. Every once in a while, to Prime members, you'll see an item offered that has the just the five payment installment plan, just for no extra cost. That's usually on Amazon products like that Kindle Fire HD 10 and and Alexa's. Sorry if it triggered it. And different kind of Amazon products, but it's very rare. It's rare. It's more rare, I'll just say, that you'll see that kind of five-month payment plan option applied to non-Amazon products. So for whatever reason, I caught this Galaxy Tab S6 in that window of the five-month payment plan, and I snapped it up instantly. I went back to check on it just a few hours later. That five-month payment plan option was not there anymore. I, I Maybe they did that to kind of move a lot of inventory, and then once the inventory started to dwindle again, they went back to... You know, you got to pay it all up at once. So I snagged this thing for a wonderful deal. I, I love it to bits. I've only been with it for a day, less than a day, but I just, I adore it. Now, it, it sounds weird to re review a product that's a year old when everyone else is going to move on to reviewing, you know, the Galaxy Tab S7 and comparing it to the iPad Pro and everything. But I... The reason I'm telling you all about this is because there are people like me, and I would imagine some of you, who aren't on this latest and greatest flagship game. So I, I always equate, you know, I talk about smartphones. Is Are you going to buy a $1,200 smartphone every single year? Or are you like me and a lot of people that are going to wait for the newest, latest, and greatest smartphone to come out and then buy the one that's a year older because you know that that's still a great phone and it just it's going to go down in price by hundreds of dollars i am definitely in that camp when it comes to tablets i'm not getting i'm not dumping 800 dollars or more into a galaxy tab s6 or s7 sorry when i know the s6 is on sale for 550 bucks for hundreds of dollars less that's the boat i'm in so i think there is going to be kind of a little a repop in interest for the Galaxy Tab S6, which is why I bought it and which is why I'm telling you about it. So while I've had it for a, a day or so, less than a day, and I love it, there are some things about it I can already tell 
that are a, a little bit annoying. Little, I don't know. There's no such thing as the perfect product. And as great as the Tab S6 is, there are still some things that I don't like about it. And I don't, I, I really don't know how to kind of like fix these issues because it, it, this product already exists. They're not going to re redesign the S6. And it really mostly comes down to the S Pen. The, the S Pen magnetically attaches to the kind of side and back, the back side of the tablet. I know on the iPad Pro it attaches to like the edge of the tablet, the top of the tablet, depending on how you orient it. The S Pen kind of attaches to the back in a little groove, which is fine. It's fine, but it's fiddly. And I find myself, I don't have a cover yet. You can get cover that kind of covers up that little back it covers up the S Pen with a, with a flap, and it helps things a lot. I've or, I've ordered a cover; it's on its way. But that S Pen's fiddly, just kind of maneuvering the tablet around. You kind of you'll detach the S Pen a little bit, and then it'll reattach, and then you'll get that little notification on the screen that the S Pen's already attached and it's a hundred percent thing. And maybe the S Pen will fall off, and it'll be like, "Hey, what do you want to do with this S Pen? Did you know you could do all these things?" Like, golly, Miss Molly. It, what a fiddly thing here on the back. And I'm sh the S Pen's great. I have dabbled with it. It's a really cool idea. It's a really cool implementation. And even though it's fiddly, mag you know, it's stuck here on the back, I will attach it. You. Oh, see? I didn't do it just cr perfectly. Attached it right there. Even though it's really cool, it's just a little fiddly. The second thing, the second biggest thing is and a lot of reviewers have said this and it's not a deal breaker but again it's fiddly the fingerprint scanner is optical it's under the glass and it's optical it shines a really bright neon green light at your fingerprint at your thumbprint in my case my thumbprint and i think most people would use their thumb on it it's not so in in the smartphones, it's an ultrasonic sensor, I believe, that scans your your fingerprint, and it's way more reliable, way way more reliable, and you can't fool it with an image. With an optical thumbprint scanner, fingerprint scanner, you can fool it with an image, and it's just fiddly. It's just fiddly. Most of the time, okay. So I just did it right there, and it and it activated my device. Now. If I and that's in portrait mode, so I'm holding it kind of long ways up. Now, if I turn it off and hold it in landscape mode, and I tap the screen so I can see the little thumbprint icon appear a little bit vaguely, and I hold it like this, oh, it went, it worked. There, okay, it worked. It wasn't working earlier, but that just kind of proves my point. It's fiddly. It doesn't work all the time. And if you get an S6. You are going to know you're going to experience that firsthand when you're just programming the fingerprint. When it when you teach it your thumbprint and you have to keep like you know tapping on that thumbprint sensor several times so that it gets a good read of all the different ways you're going to touch the thumbprint sensor. With an ultrasonic sensor, it, it usually goes a lot easier. But with this optical sensor under the screen, I had to run literally. I had to teach it my thumbprint 10 times like on the 10th time it worked maybe it wasn't the 10th time maybe it was the 7th or 8th time but you get what i'm saying it, it it's something that should just work the first time you should just be able to teach it once and it knows your thumbprint your, your or your fingerprint it wasn't the case for me not with this optical under the glass sensor i i had to run it seven or eight times because it would it would fail i get to like 82 percent of the way through of, of th pressing my thumb down on the thing but like, oh, we couldn't do it try again okay you go through it for another 30 seconds 45 seconds tap 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 wiggle your thumb tap 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 oh can't get it 91 percent no 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 start over fiddly Say, wow, these reviewers really, uh, they nailed it. They nailed it when it comes to that fiddly thumbprint scanner. So it's not the end of the world. You can do facial recognition, and apparently it works way better. I I try to do as as little of as little biometrics as possible in my device devices. So for instance, my phone, it, it only works through a pin code or the fingerprint or both. On the tablet, it's no different. It's only going to work with my thumbprint or the pin code. 
and that's it. I have never done iris scan. I have never done facial recognition. I've always kind of just done the minimal. Two, two method, two factor authentication, two method authentication, and that's it. Because I don't want to give Samsung my iris. And I don't want to give Samsung my facial recognition. It's bad enough that I'm doing my fingerprint. And I'm not getting all tinfoil hat here. But I'm, I, I just, you know, it's kind of just due diligence and being as safe as you can with your identity and who you are. And when you're giving them, to me, this is just my opinion, when you're giving them your thumbprint and your iris scan and a facial scan and a lot of times different companies, you're given your DNA. You don't have to give your DNA to unlock anything, but Ancestry.com and different sites like that, you are giving them your actual genetic makeup. It's, it's nuts where we're at today. 1984 was about the government taking all that stuff from you by force. It was forced upon the population. What it, what George Orwell got wrong is that we have we voluntarily we voluntarily give that up. We line up around the block to spend $1200 at the Apple store so that we can give so that we have the privilege of giving Apple our thumbprint, our iris scan, our facial recognition and God knows what else. We pay to give them that stuff. They, Big Brother hasn't taken anything from us. We've, he, they've, Big Brother has convinced us, ha, has associated an endorphin rush with us volunteering, volunteering that information of our own accord because it feels good to us. It's kind of brilliant the way. And I don't think Orwell ever anticipated that we would be chomping at the bit to give that information to Big Brother. The future he foresaw was that Big Brother would take it by force. All right, now I'm going to take off my tinfoil hat and we will move on to the next subject. It's just funny. I'm not saying that if you give your iris or your facial recognition or you've sent off your DNA to places like Ancestry.com to figure out your your genetics and your, your ancestry, I'm not, I don't have anything against other people doing it. I'm not going to say that I'll never do it at some point in the future. I just think it's important that we that we're all on the same page, knowing what we're doing. And I've said on I've gone off on Geek Therapy Radio prior in the past, way back when, which is not that long ago for Geek Therapy Radio. I've only been on for about three years, but I've gone off on my tangents about do I think that they're using this data, your thumbprints and iris and all your biometrics for 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 evil do i think that amazon and, and apple and all them are and zuckerberg and facebook are collecting all this data from us to perpetrate evil upon us like they're going to cull the herd and, and kind of mass population control and extinction and, and group us up and put us in cages and things no i don't think it's that it, it, honestly it's just to sell you toilet paper and crap you don't need really so it's going to track your GPS and your location, and you've you've been browsing Amazon for tablets. Let's say I've been browsing Amazon for tablets. It's going to notice, hey, you're next to a Best Buy. Google's going to say, we notice you're next to a Best Buy. They've got Galaxy Tabs S6 is on sale for six hundred thirty dollars or whatever. That's what they're using all those biometrics for. Hey, we know where you. We know you're close to this location, and we think we know because your smart refrigerator, your smart Samsung refrigerator, that you're low on baloney. You're close to an HEB. Bologna's on sale for 99 cents a pound or whatever. That's what it's using all that data for. It's just to market and sell us stuff. It, it, it knows our, our purchasing habits. It knows where we go. Google, man, it's freaky. Google knows where you've been. You can see your your movement history in Google and on in Google Maps. Here's the places, here's your most traveled route. Here's how long you spent traveling. You sat at this location for this many minutes. You walked into, you you visited this Kroger three times in the last month. It's, it's crazy. So I don't think they're collecting all this data to round us up and put us in a mass grave. Sorry to be so dark. There's, there's no financial incentive for them to do that. There's no financial incentive for them to kill us. There is financial incentive to keep getting our money, trying to convince us and persuade us to spend money at these places in a more optimized way. 
that they can sell to their advertisers. Hey, user number 54365. Iris is this, fingerprint is that. Here's their GPS location. They hear they given their DNA to ancestry, da da da, based on all their history and their and their DNA and ancestry history, history. They're prone to high, having high blood cholesterol. And they go by this Walgreens or CVS at this frequency, these times during the week, most likely. So let's send them an ad at this day of the week, at this time, right before work, that they need to go get some blood, have the, get their blood pressure checked or go get some cholesterol medication or visit their doctor. That's what they're using it all for. It's just to sell you stuff and, and more optimize you as a product to a seller. Really, and, and it's not evil. It's just to sell you stuff. It's always just to sell you stuff. Okay, now really putting the tinfoil hat down. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, AMD Ryzen 5000 series processors. I, I am not an expert, kind of a jack of all trades here, but I'm not an expert on kind of a CPU architecture. What I can tell you, though, is that the 5000 series chips are going to be even more so optimized to higher speeds of, of RAM. It's no stretch of the imagination. It's kind of common knowledge that AMD processors and AMD uh, GPUs, like integrated graphics, APUs and such, are critically tied to the speed of the RAM. When you're sharing video RAM, especially with the system RAM, it, it depends on how fast the system RAM is. So anyways, I'm not talking about GPUs here. Radeon 5000, not Radeon, AMD Ryzen is so, let's get all the naming right, AMD Ryzen Zen 3 5000 series processors are even more optimized to fast RAM. And AMD, all I'm getting at here, the big takeaway, the point of all this, is that AMD says the sweet spot for 5000 series Ryzen processors is 4000 megahertz DDR4 RAM. 3000 series, the sweet spot according to AMD was 3800 megahertz. The sweet spot for 5000 series processors, so the 5900X, 5950X, and so on, 4000 megahertz RAM, which typically would mean that you'd buy 3600 megahertz RAM or whatever, a high speed RAM, and see if you can overclock it, get the XMP profile going to get it to that 4000 hertz. Now, I will mention here, why is my Zoom all wacky doodah here? Oh, there we go. That's good. I'm using my tablet for, for these notes. So the relationship, according to AMD, between the Infinity Fabric, the memory controller clock, and the, and the memory clock itself is one to one to one. So that makes it for the 5000 series so that DDR4 4000 megahertz RAM is the sweet spot. That's the big takeaway. 4000 megahertz frequency RAM is the sweet spot for 5000 series Zen 3 desktop CPUs. So I would wager and I would implore and I would advise that if you are building a brand new system, I'm saying a brand new system from scratch and you're jumping on board to AMD with the 5000 series processors, you will do yourself a favor to go ahead and pick up RAM capable of hitting 4000 megahertz. That's the nugget of information you can take away from this. All right, so let's pause real quick. We're about 38 minutes, 39-ish minutes in here. Let's pause for the ad. I just want to say real quick, these ads, I don't know what ad you're going to hear. I, whatever you hear is not necessarily endorsed by Geek Therapy Radio. So if, if it goes to an ad about a vape shop or I don't know what the heck, <laughs> I have no idea. Like some sort of uh, d detention center on the border. I have no freaking idea. Or a political ad. Whatever you're about to hear in these ads, I do not necessarily endorse. So anyways, let's play the ad now and just... Get it out of the way. All right, so the last topic to discuss here in Geek Therapy Radio podcast today has to do with the drones. And I'm going to talk about a specific product here, but it's the overall concept in general that I find 
the most fascinating and hopefully you'll find fascinating too. There's no way I don't have listeners who haven't at least dabbled with drones. When's the last time you've flown your drone? It's fun. I am a drone, I would say, enthusiast a, a bit. I think they're I think they're really cool. I think they're really cool and I freaking love my DJI Mavic Pro. It's a first generation Mavic Pro. I Adore it is an amazing tool. It's not just fun, but it's an amazing tool. And if you watch any of my YouTube videos, I try to break out the drone more and more often now. So I friggin' love my drone. Well, a Chinese website has revealed that a recent update in the DJI Fly app for oh, what is it? The Mavic Mini that the recent update increases the range by double. It gives you twice the range, at least for the the signal. That doesn't mean you can fly it, you know, it's, it's not increasing battery capacity. That's not battery capacity. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about communication range, video range, and, and whatnot. How the device talks to the controller, how the device kind of sends the video feed back and forth. It's effectively doubled the range. It went up to 2.5 uh, kilometers without loss of the video feed, up from the original 1.5 kilometers. Owners of the Mavic Mini also say that they used to lose connection to the controller around 1.7 kilometers, and now that happens at about twice the, not a little less than twice the range. They now lose control lose communication between the drone and the controller at 2.8 kilometers. So it used to be 1.7 kilometers before the drone would just lose the feed from the controller. Now it's 2.8 kilometers. That's a lot of range that got boosted in an update. In a patch. So with electric cars, with EVs, Tesla and Audi and whoever can update the range, the actual like mileage of the car before needing to recharge they can update that through a software update they do different it's it's a software update that kind of more optimizes the power and the battery and the power delivery so it ekes out a bit more range we're not really talking about that here with the with the with the uh drones we're talking about communication range radio range it'd be like if you had an older remote, if you had a remote control car and you can only operate it, you know, 50 feet away from you, and then all of a sudden there's a software update that lets you operate it 200 feet away from you or 100 feet away from you, doubling the range. DJI has not officially announced announced why this is yet. I can't find anywhere where DJI has said, "Oh yeah, here's what we did to extend the the communication range between the drone and the user." So here's what's fun to speculate, and here's what the, here's where the concept, the, the fun of the concept comes in. As of recording right now, just off the cuff, just going with the flow here, I'm thinking that they increased the range in one, if not both of these ways. There's two ways they could have increased the range. They might have done both here. One is that they... Through a software update, they've increased the power, the transmission power of both the drone and the controller. That maybe the radio amplifier in the drone and in the controller could go up a little higher, could draw a little bit more power, therefore give you a stronger signal coming from both devices. That would make all the sense in the world. Two you can achieve the same result or a similar result just by changing the frequency at which the drone and the controller communicate with each other. So let's say you are at 2.4 gigahertz and it's technically like 2.41 gigahertz. Now let's say 2.41 gigahertz has become extremely populated with with Wi-Fi routers and cell phones and, and whatever. It's become very populated. That cuts down on the range. There's a lot more interference at 2.41 gigahertz. So in the patch, they could have said, okay, now the drone and the controller operate at 2.4325 gigahertz, a, a, a much clearer band or a much more narrow band even. 
That's one way you can increase the range. You basically go to an uncluttered frequency. I wonder if DJI has done both. What, what I also wonder is, is if this is only isolated to China. I don't own a DJI Mavic Mini. I can't, not, I can't test this. And I don't know whether it's going to come to other drones or not. I don't know when I go to update my Mavic Pro that I'm going to get any extra range. So that that first guess or second guess I made where I meant, you know, I just said that they just go to a different frequency, a less cluttered frequency with less interference, less crowded that can increase the range. That entirely depends on region also. So it could just be that whatever the nat the standard for that those frequencies is in China, that doesn't mean that the same frequencies are used over here. So if you move the frequency between the, the drone and the controller to 2.4, 3.15 gigahertz, and that's fine in China, that's an unpopulated frequency in China, over here that might move it directly to the routers that most commercial businesses use, maybe that 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 Belkin or whatever Linksys uses over here. But updates can certainly be regional. They can certainly code into the update. Say, okay, North America, we're extending the range. It's not going to be the exact same frequencies that we used in China, but it'll be different. They can easily do that. So it's a very, how did they do this? Rhetorical question to you. The listener, you don't have to email me about this unless you really want to. You have a lot of information to shed on this. Maybe you work for DJI or something. How do you think they're increasing the range the range of the drone in correlation to the remote control? Do you think they're boosting the power? That's the easiest way. Or do you think they're moving the, the frequency to a different band? Or do you think... Number three, they're doing both. They're increasing the power and they're moving it to a less cluttered band. Or do you think they're doing something else completely? But I, I just can't conception. I can't think about what they would be doing differently. Because increasing range like this isn't. Remember what we're saying here. What what users are reporting that they would go 1.7 kilometers and then it would just lose connection with the controller. That doesn't mean that's not arbitrary. That's physics. That's physics cutting off the communication between the controller and the drone. Now they're reporting that they can fly a lot further out, 2.8 kilometers, other than 1.7 kilometers. You, you can't fly far enough. Away. It's physics. It's, it either means that the transmission loses its strength, loses its punch at 1.7 kilometers, and now that punch extends out to 2.8 kilometers. That's just physics. It's more powerful. It's more water flowing out of the tap or out of the hose. It's just louder, a louder volume now. It's more of it. Or did they move the frequency or both? We can think about this all day long. I don't think it was a mistake. Do you think? Could it be a mistake? Oops, we didn't mean to patch that in there. There's a mistake in the patch that upped the amplitude. One way you could test that is if it, they actually upped the amplitude, if they actually upped the power of the transmission between the drone and the controller, is that one or the other, if not both devices, would run out of battery faster. So let's say... The runtime for the Mavic Mini, I don't know, but I'm just pulling it off the top of my head, is 16 minutes. Now the runtime is at 14 and a half minutes on average. Well, you're losing a minute and a half. That that would be an indicator that the radio transmitter is sucking up more power, aka putting out more power. But we don't know. It's just fun to think how they can. It's just cool to know that they can improve products, improve devices, not just drones, but you can improve things with an over-the-air software update. Tesla's been doing it. Audi, I think they've done it once or twice for their current e-tron. And you know, going into the EV future, that there are going to be over-the-air updates that increase or decrease or whatever, modify the range of electric vehicles in the future. That's just, that's where we are now. We get these over-the-air updates that improve our experience with the products. 
but I've never heard of a software update improving the range of a drone, the radio transmission range of the drone. That's cool. And I'm not saying it hasn't happened before. This is the first time I've ever heard about it. And with a huge company like DJI, which DJI is pretty much and effectively the Apple of drones, of the drone marketplace, it's just really cool. I think that's all I got to say for right now. You know that I could go on for another two hours just by myself, running my mouth about whatever's coming to mind, other, you know, geeky subjects. I almost wanted to go off on a 5G tangent. I won't. <laughs> I get so butthurt about 5G. So I'm just going to leave it here. Thank you so much for listening to the Geek Therapy Radio podcast. Remember, share it with your friends if you think they'll enjoy it. If you enjoy it and you think they'll enjoy it, word of mouth would be amazing. So share Geek Therapy Radio with your friends if, you, if you're if you so inclined. That would help out a lot. We are getting down to the wire. My son's going to be born soon. I am very excited to geek out with my little boy. Above all else, if you don't take anything else away from the podcast, from listening to this, if you've been listening for three years and you don't take anything away from this, at all. You think I'm a dumbass, you think I'm stupid, whatever. I'm prone to being stupid sometimes. Or if you think this whole thing is great, you think I've been great, whatever I've said. If you forget anything I've said, if you remember anything I say, the one thing I need you to remember and take away from this, please, is to know that you are worthy of love. To know that you are worthy of giving love saying I love you to somebody and you're worthy of them repeating it back to you. I love you. You say, yeah, I, I'm worthy of that. Thank you so much for loving me. It feels, it, it, a lot of times we kind of, when people say I love you, we think, ah, I, well, I hate myself. There's no way you could love me. I don't love me. You are also worthy of your own self-respect and your own self-confidence. It's okay to love and be loved. Please take that away. I'm not being all hippy-dippy and frou-frou about this. The world is a cold, hurtful place. There is evil in this world. There's good in this world. The world is not black and white. It's often gray and mundane and tough and joyful. There's all of that. Just know that through all of it, in the pain and in the joy, you are equally deserving of love in, in both parts of your journey through this life the ups and downs the constant going through it all is that you are worthy of love please remember that if you don't remember anything else you are worthy of love all of its forms thank you so much for listening to geek therapy radio podcast i'll talk to you so soon peace